In this video, we're gonna take a look at the complete history of the Springbank Distillery, starting in the early 1800s and working all the way up until the present day. So welcome back to the channel, everybody. Uh, we're doing a big video today. It's one that I've been looking forward to producing for a while. And yes, we're taking a look at the full history of the Springbank Distillery, starting in the early 1800s and going all the way through. Now, Springbank, it's, it's one of my favorite distilleries. I've said it before, I've got a lot of affinity with it. I love their whiskey. I love their, their, their sort of slightly traditional position in the industry. They're not sort of like a big mega corporation like a lot of many of the other distilleries are. And they make some amazing bottles of whiskey. And like, you know, of course, there's the 1919 bottle that sold for 180,000 pounds. And of course, you know, we've got some nice bottles of Springbank available on our shop. And don't forget that if you've got bottles that you're looking to buy or sell, make sure you visit our website, which is marklittler.com because we can help you sell your bottles. And we've also got a massive collection of bottles available for immediate purchase. Now, this bottle here that's with me is one that's available from on our shop and it's an amazing 1980s bottling of Springbank 12 year old. And I just love these old Gothic S style labels. But, you know, if this is a 1980s bottling and we know that the history started in the 1800s, how did it all begin? So Springbank was the 14th licensed distillery to be established in the Campbelltown region. And it was opened officially in 1828 and was built on the site of what had been an illegal still run by Archibald Mitchell for much longer. And in fact, there'd been whiskey produced on that site since at least the 1660s. Now, the legally operating Springbank distillery was founded by William Reed, who was an in-law of the Mitchells. However, in 1837, due to financial dif difficulties, Reed sold Springbank to brothers John and William Mitchell. And what's interesting here is that the Springbank distillery is still in the hands of the Mitchell family today, as the chairman, Hed you know, as the current chairman, Headley G. Wright, is John Mitchell's great, great grandson. Now, the Mitchells were quite the whiskey family. John's brothers, Archibald and Hugh, were parties in a or partners in a distillery that I can't even begin to pronounce the name of. We'll put it up on the screen here somewhere which is also in Campbelltown. And William went on to open the Glengal Distillery in 1872 as well. And they weren't the only ones. Their sister Mary opened the Drummore Distillery in 1834, although it was incredibly short lived and I think it closed in 1837. Having operated steadily for a decade or so, there were two defining jumps in Springbank's profile during the 19th century. One small and the other one much more influential. The first small jump was in 1838 when the whiskey giant Johnny Walker recognised an increasing demand for Campbelltown whiskey and turned to Springbank to purchase 118 gallons for their blends. Now, this was the first indication, arguably, that Springbank's profile was on the rise. Now, the second bigger or larger turning point for Springbank and the Campbelltown region as a whole came in 1885, when writer and distilling historian Alfred Barnard visited the region and toured all 21 distilleries as part of his endeavour to visit all of the distilleries in the UK. Now, Barnard was one of the leading voices on whiskey distilleries, and after this tour, he produced the 500-page tome, Whiskey Distilleries of the United Kingdom, which is still considered one of the most influential books written on whiskey. I think it was published in 1887 and Barnard proclaimed that Campbelltown was a whiskey producing city and soon after the region's popularity really did start to grow and in order to secure future ownership of the Springbank distillery as the Campbelltown's popularity grew in 1887 John and Alexander Mitchell established J.A. Mitchell & Co and this in turn brings us to the end of the 19th century. So now we move into the 20th century and after 72 years of growing success, we now move into what's really the second phase of Springbank's history. At the turn of the century, things took a turn downhill for both Springbank and the Campbelltown region. And we start to see a decline in Springbank's popularity. As it often does, popular opinion was shifting during the early 20th century and it was turning away from the heavy peaty whiskey that was synonymous with Campbelltown and therefore Springbank. So what Springbank did, they made a turn towards lighter spirits and, and Springbank, you know, they reacted to this change in demand fairly well. 
they turned to using coal rather than peat to dry their, mil their, their malt and as a result were producing lighter whiskies more in keeping with that current trend and interestingly it was during this time that Springbank produced what would eventually become known as their most expensive bottle at auction the one that we mentioned earlier the 1919 single malt that was left for, to mature for 50 years and eventually bottled in 1970. Now this achieved £180,000 at auction and it's actually quite a fascinating bottle that we are going to make a video about because it's one of these bottles that the same whiskey can have multiple different prices just depending on the type of bottle that it's in. Now, the change in sort of style and taste was just the sort of start of the problems for the whiskey region. You know, the global recession was pushing up the price of coal, and in, which is an integral resource to the whiskey production process. And the prohibition era of the 1920s also caused problems. And as Campbelltown was on the very west of Scotland, it was a prime location for exporting illegal whiskey to the USA. And seeing the profit in this, most of the region's distilleries arguably began running their stills at, you know, much more faster to distill quicker and what would eventually produce a lower quality spirit. And over the course of the 1920s and early 1930s, Campbelltown's reputation for good whiskey was tarnished and blenders began to look elsewhere. And although Springbank tried its best to adapt and survive, its attempts were somewhat futile, and sadly it was forced to cease production in 1926 for the next seven years. Fortunately, this hardship wasn't to last, as Springbank resumed production in 1933, and by 1934, it would just be one of two remaining distilleries in Campbelltown, and this was from when there was over 20. Now, it's interesting that Campbelltown was this whiskey city, and there are a few really good books about the history of Campbelltown, and we'll put them in the, in the description below. But Springbank continued to produce whiskey and traditionally malting its own barley using local peat and distilling the spirit two and a half times. And that was until the 1960s when it closed its maltings and began sourcing grain from elsewhere. Now they did however ha still have somewhat of a underutilized bottling line at the time and as an attempt to rectify this in 1969 J.A. Mitchell Limited bought independent bottled carden heads and both entities then used a Springbank bottling line and only a year later Springbank bottled that 1919 whiskey that we've already mentioned so it's interesting to see how we've got whiskey produced in the 19 no, or the 1910s in 1919 becoming relevant in the 1970s and again the the the, the, the profits and the benefits and the sales that that would have brought into the distillery at the time now obviously it wasn't for selling it wasn't selling for hundreds of thousands of pounds in the 1970s but it's it's the foresight of laying down these casks for incredibly long periods of times that gives the current day distillery in the 1970s or even today the opportunity to bottle some fantastic whiskey and this is what Springbank have always been really good at it seems in somewhat of an inconvenient twist popular opinion shifted back towards peated malt in the 1970s and at this point Springbank had been producing a lighter non-peated whiskey for nearly 70 years or so so instead of changing it out you know in changing its output it established Longro. Now Longro was first established in 1973 and it's a twice distilled spirit from heavily peated malt. Now it's important to note that the Longro whiskey is produced at the Springbank distillery on the same apparatus but it's just a different brand name for that whiskey. So from 1979 and into the 1980s, there was a considerable downturn in the whiskey market, now known as the Whiskey Lock. And as a result, Springbank was mothballed in 1979. And Springbank wasn't alone because at least 15 distilleries closed their doors permanently in the 1980s. Fortunately, Springbank was able to continue selling whiskey during this time. And in 1985, the first long row bottle was ever sold. And it's at this point we get towards a new chapter in the history, which is sort of like roughly from the 1990s onto the present day. In 1987, from that original closure, prior it resumed intermittent production but it wasn't until 1989 that full production began again once more and as we move into the 1990s Springbank under its new owner Headley Wright made the decision to focus on developing the single malt market because we forget that for a long time blended whiskey was really the ultra dominant product and arguably it still is as 80 percent of scotch whiskey sales are still blended whiskey but and the single malt category only really grew into its own through the 80s and 90s and arguably from the 1990s and it was in the 1990s uh, 
with the dawn of the new millennium that we see a change of events that really cement the profile of the Springbank distillery to what we're familiar with today. And in 1992, 32 years after they closed it, Springbank's restarted its on-site floor maltings and it began solely using its own malt, making, that own, making it the only self-sufficient distillery in Scotland. Now, in 1997, that brought a new venture for Springbank. It started to produce a triple distilled, non-peated whiskey that was named Hazelburn. Again, Hazelburn whiskey is a light and fruity whiskey compared with the you know the other springbank offerings and it kind of perfected the trifecta of springbank spirits hazelburn springbank and longro and as we welcomed in the new millennium and worried about the millennium bug remember that headley wright was expanding his whiskey empire and in 2000 wright bought the site and structures of the glengal distillery which had previously been owned by william mitchell wright's great great uncle so the newly rebuilt Glengal distillery opened in 2004 and was producing a sweet floral lightly peated whiskey under the name Kilkerran. So the Glengal distillery doesn't produce Glengal whiskey. Again, it's like this branding again, which when you look at it, Springbank have been masters of this branding of, of multiple products. So they've got two sites arguably with Glengal, but they're producing many products that they can bring to the market to, you know, to cater for customer demand in taste. And this new, this was like the first new distillery uh, in Campbelltown when the Glengal distillery reopened for 125 years. And alongside Springbank's growing status, it ensured Springbank, uh, or ensured Campbelltown was once again recognized as an iconic whiskey region. I think the Scotch Whiskey Association tried to say that there's not enough distilleries in the Campbelltown region to classify it as a region. And they looked towards the lowlands and they thought, well, there's three there. So if we open another one up, you can't shut down our region because you'll have to shut down the lowlands region, which, which I think is, again, is quite fun. It's good marketing really, isn't it? So, and if we sort of come back to 2008, Springbank again closed temporarily for a six months period to refurbish and rebuild a new warehouse at the distillery. And it, you know, I don't think full production resumed until 2009. And throughout the 2000s and 2010s, Springbank has developed a cult status among whiskey lovers. And there's arguably a specific reason for this. I think there's many, but I think one of the contributing factors is the fact that the distillery has the capacity to produce around 750,000 litres of spirit each year. And I think in 2019, it only produced 275,000 litres, so way below its capacity. Now. 10% of that was uh, long row, 10% and was Hazelburn, and obviously the remaining 80% was Springbank. But by keeping their sort of like uh, production levels way below capacity, Springbank always ensures their whiskey's in high demand. You can argue that it's always of a very high quality because they, they don't have to rush production. And the very low supply means that bottling runs and bottling numbers are often sort of relatively limited. Look at the Springbank local barley this year, for instance. Now, when 2020 arrived, we're all familiar with what came next. Uh, the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic affected the industry hugely, but maybe not as much as many people will have you think, because a lot of people think that all the distilleries closed down completely. But that's not the case. I think at the start of the pandemic, a lot of distilleries closed the doors for a very brief period of time. But you've got to remember that in 2021, most of these distilleries are computer operated. You know, they don't need a lot of computers, uh, need a lot of people to operate the distillery and carry on production. And if you close your distillery, it's being very short sighted because you're not allowing for this production of whiskey in you know, the sale of whiskey in 10, 20, 30 years time. So if you hear that the production of whiskey in 2020 is very, very scarce, it's true, but only of a very few distilleries and one of them being Springbank because they did close and so did Glen Farkless, you know, the family owned ones. They don't have this demand to make whiskey for the blends and things like all well, the Diageo and Edrington distilleries do arguably. But as we said, Springbank did close and but, but when they announced that they were closing, in, I think it was March 2020, they said that it was a, an already planned indefinite shutdown. So was it? 
I don't know, maybe it was just a way to save costs and sort of figure out how things were going. And I know a lot of retailers found it incredibly difficult to to get hold of stock, you know, through 2020 because, you know, the whole distribution side from Springbank seemed to quieten down as well, as far as I can tell. Now, the, obviously the distillery, the bottling line, shop and tours, and they were all closed. And I think they did produce a small amount of hand sanitizer, which was offered to sort of like local community groups uh, and where it, would, you know, where it was needed most in the region. And then again, in, I think it was August in 2020, the production was able to resume. However, none of the tours were able to take place and the shop was still closed. Now, Springbank, you know, in 2020 went online a lot, can you believe? And they started doing lots of virtual tastings. And I think they had tasting weeks in October, February and May. And these kits, again, were really, really sought after by collectors. This year they have opened uh, to the public again and I think tours are up and running again and it really is sort of back to full strength and the distillery now in 2021 it's probably the most sought after distillery your bottles on the secondary market if you look at sources like Rare Whiskey 101 and Whiskey Stats I think that Springbank is now like out outranking Macallan in terms of popularity at auction so it, it's interesting I think to sort of see how the distillery has gone from full circle you know from from its you know its, its establishment in the 1820s through various difficult times closing when it was necessary and then you know even to the present day when it was closing when it deemed itself necessary when other you know many of the distilleries you know chose to remain open so there we have it there's the you know rather condensed complete history of the Springbank distillery and I hope it's helped you be able to be able to put a bit of context into some of these bottles so what was happening in the 1980s you know we think of these 1980s bottles but we don't think of the you know the circumstances of the industry like the whiskey lock perhaps or sort of like going back to that 1919 bottling and you know a lot of people don't understand whiskey collecting. They think, well, whiskey's for drinking, but there's so much more to it than just the liquid that's inside this. What about what was happening? You know, the history of this bottle, you know, 1980s bottle. So this was distilled in the 1970s. You know, it's, it's the changes in the management and the structure of the production that make these bottles interesting to collectors and drinkers. So we really love looking in the history of distilleries and the history of these bottles and if you do too make sure you like and subscribe to this channel because we've got lots of new content coming out we publish a new video every thursday and if you've got interest in buying bottles of springbank or you've got any bottles or casks of springbank that you want to sell head to the mark littler website we've got loads of information and resources on there and we look forward to seeing you in the next video